according to your wish. Hi, I'm Alan McDaniel, and I want to welcome you once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. As we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount, the most radical, wonderful teaching ever given, Jesus' most complete sermon. So I'm joined here this evening, if indeed it's evening where you are while we're watching this, with my lovely wife, Alice, and my brother, Mark. Um, Before we start, let me just ask, Father, that you would bless our time together, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see wonderful things in your word. And Lord, we would see that your word is training in righteousness. And Lord, we would take this instruction from your word and go out and live it every day of our lives. Help us to see what you desire in our lives through the teaching of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We left off in our last session together in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5. So we'll pick up uh, now in verse 21. But before we do, let me just remind you, that these, that all of the teachings, uh, I think this is our 14th week in the study, are available here online on our, on our site at BibleTalk.com. So you can go back and review those, watch them again, or invite others to come and join us and watch. Uh, but the thing that I want to do, we, we talked in the last session about religion versus righteousness where Jesus was talking about our, we have to, what we live has to exceed what the Pharisees and the scribes were living. That's where we left off. And now I think what we're going to look at is what Jesus is saying when he says, let's get to the heart of this matter. And remember I said that, the, you know, it's, I, I've never really quite seen it this way, but I'm beginning to experience it, that the Beatitudes is the Sermon on the Mount. And now we're in Jesus's commentary on that, all right? So before I start, I think what we're going to talk about in this session is basically a commentary on this beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart. You know, the heart is the first organ formed in a mother's womb. That's right. That that heart, when a baby is conceived, when a child is conceived, what happens is there immediately begins to form the heart. And typically, by the, at least by the 22nd day, that heart is pumping blood within that life that's in the mother's womb. And indeed, it is a, a life. So the heart is the foundation. The heart is the foundation. And in Psalm 139, uh, verse 13, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. This is not, it is not a choice, it is a child. And that child... That life begins at the moment of conception, and God is forming that child in the mother's womb. It is indeed a miracle of birth, but that starts nine months before that baby comes out into the light of day, right? So that part is the first thing that starts to happen in this child. Why? Again, we're going to always use the scripture to interpret scripture, because it says in Leviticus 17.11 that for the life of the flesh is in the blood. All right? So this life is being formed. What it needs is blood. And the heart is the organ responsible for pumping blood to every part of the body. From the top of the head to the tip of the toes to the fingertips. Mm-hmm. Right? All the extremities. Absolutely. Now, the, when we're talking about the heart here, when Scripture is talking about the heart, mm-hmm. You know, we're not talking about that, just that lump of flesh that's in here. It goes well beyond that. And as much as we can sit here and try and describe what that means, I don't think we can. It is the, when we're talking spiritually, it is the core of man's being. It is everything. Because that, you know, if... Can I just say that thinking about that, it is the vessel where God's love is going to be contained. Oh, we're going to, sure. I mean... Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, I think Alice is referring to in 5.5, in five, five, and talks about how the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the word of God has been inscribed on the tablets of our heart. But that's getting a little ahead of myself. There, there's something else. Uh, when King Solomon got his wisdom, 
God said he's going to put it in the heart. Not in the mind, but in the heart. Well, that's what I'm saying. And, but we're not talking you know, about just this fleshly, no, just about this no, fleshly organ. We're talking about the core of man's being. Right. It represents everything. Why? Because it is responsible for life and everything. You know, the highest command, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We've got to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. But Jesus added in the New Testament with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Mm -hmm. But your mind can't survive without the heart. Let the blood stop flowing to the brain. It doesn't take long. And what you have is what's brain called a, a stroke. Mm -hmm. Or at least you pass out. Well, you, I mean, you have a stroke yes. if, you, right. if it becomes blood deprived mm -hmm. because it carries that life giving everything oxygen, yeah. but, but the flesh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm -hmm. So the brain is dependent upon the heart. What happens if blood is cut off? You know, it, it'll die. It'll die. Before it does, it becomes numb. Yes. And then there's a great danger. Mm -hmm. In becoming numb before you die and I am talking spiritually okay because we have to be conscious and stay aware but the heart is symbolically the core of man's being the, the Greek word for heart that's used here is cardio that's where we get our words cardio cardiovascular right everything associated with the heart the Latin words but it's also that comes from the word core which is core it's the same thing in Latin that's the Latin word for it is core the, the, the French word for heart is cure, you know, C-O-E-U-R, I think. Um, so uh, the core is the center of everything. Mm -hmm. So spiritually, this is what the Lord is, is talking about. It's symbolic of everything. And when people talk about um, certain things, they'll say it's the heart of the matter. Well, obviously, I mean, throughout the history of mankind, we've always talked about that heart being the central part. And we're not, we're not talking about this physical lump of flesh. Yeah. We're talking about something that far surpasses that, that wraps up a man's being, mm -hmm. what, he, what he thinks, what he feels, what he believes. That's what I mean, you've got to believe in your heart. That's what the Word of God says, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's for that reason that God searches the heart. I mean, mankind, we look at outward appearance of things, of situation, and people. You know, it was when, when God had decided to replace Saul as being king over Israel, he sent the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem because he was going to anoint the new king. And when Samuel showed up at Jesse's house, the first thing that happens, he brings out his firstborn son. Which is normal. I mean, mm -hmm. the firstborn son always got priority in the, in the Hebrew household. So Samuel, seeing him, his name was Eliab, I think. Uh, Samuel immediately assumed, oh, this is God's choice. But if you know the story in, in uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, what happens is that God goes through all of the sons till he gets to the least of the sons, whose name is David. And here's what the Lord spoke to the prophet Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now this is, this is key to understanding all the scriptures, that God doesn't judge by outward appearance. He searches that core of man's being. He searches the heart of, of a matter, right? How important is the heart? Well, our heart is made righteous. The promise of God in the new covenant is he would take the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. It, right? He would give us new life by changing our hearts. How many times did David pray, you know, change my heart, create me a clean heart? All, all of these things. The heart is where righteousness should live. Because, as Alice said, that's where the love of God resides. Mm -hmm. The love of God. But I just, it struck me, thinking about this, if you know the story of Sapphira and, Sapphira and Ananias, Ananias in the book of Acts, all right? Listen to this. This is from Acts 5, verses 3 and 4. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? Remember, this is a case... Where, where people were bringing 
selling the land, doing all kinds of things, and bringing it to the apostles so, so that the needs of all of the saints would be met? Yes. yes. Well, Ananias and Sapphira came and said that they had done the same thing. When in fact, they had not given, they, they claimed to have sold their property and were giving the entire thing. But that was not the truth. So now, Peter says to him, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own, he says. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Listen to this now. This is a deed, that this is a, a sin that led to the death of both of these people. Yes. And Peter says to him, why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, the reason I say that, you've got to get this, this is really important. Is he saying that this sin was conceived, it was given birth in his heart? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, 34. Man judges by outward appearance. You know, one of the things is it's easier to do that because it's easier to hide the outward appearance. You can do things in the dark and hope you never get caught. But God sees the heart. And it's it's not so much the deed. It's not, not, it's not so much the doing of the deed. It's once you have conceived it and given birth in your heart, what's happening is that Jesus is going to say you're already guilty of this thing. Even if the action hasn't right. taken place. Now, I, don't, I didn't want to get into, I'm not trying to get into the issue of abortion and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to me that basically what, what's being said there is that that sin came to life in the heart before it came action, before it was manifested, in the same way that a child is born in the womb, all right, and it becomes manifest. You don't see it exactly. for, right. until that right. comes forth. But the Lord is saying that sin has life. Once you have brought it to life in, in, your, heart. in your heart. Okay. <clears throat> so that's why it's so important to, to, to think of David saying, create me a clean heart, O God, yes. and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 51. But teach me your way, O Lord, he prayed in Psalm 86. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Mm -hmm. Now, that's important because we're talking about, if he says unite my heart, that means it's like it's divided, right? Yes. Because you can't set your, your heart, you can't set your mind on two different things. And again, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, you will see deeper and deeper commentary from Jesus on all of this. When he says, no man can serve God and man. No man can serve two masters. He doesn't say not that you, not that you, should, you shouldn't do this, but you can't do it. It's an impossibility. It's an impossibility. So it's good for us to purpose to serve God with all of our heart. We have to do that. Yes. But the fact of the matter is you're not capable of doing all this on your own. And it takes the love and the grace and the power of God and the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why David prayed, create me a clean heart. Okay? So what we're going to go look at now, starting in verse 21, is the fact that, well, let me read it. Starting, I'm going to read 21 and 22, right? Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Jesus said, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the, the, the court, the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So it's just the action. You know, it's, it's anger. Where does anger start? In the heart. In the heart. Mm -hmm. It's not the act, that, but it starts there. It starts because you allow it to come to life. That's why I said, think about what Peter said to Ananias. It was conceived in the heart. Right? And as far as Jesus is concerned, once it's conceived, once that anger comes to life in your heart, mm -hmm. the deed is a done deed. You're guilty of murder. Now, let's get really real here for a minute, okay? Because we're talking about, I said this is the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached. 
it's easy for us to, to kind of read these things and blow by them. Just pluck them off. You know. But if you are a Bible-believing Christian, and believe me, most of the people that we associate with in the church are call themselves or claim to be Bible-believing Christians. Mm -hmm. In that case, let's be very realistic and say, when was the last time you were angry at somebody? Hmm. I mean, do you understand that Jesus Christ is saying you're guilty of murder? You're guilty of murder. This is serious stuff. But we treat it lightly. And then what we do is we make excuses. We justify our anger. Oh, you don't know what that person did. Oh, you don't know what that person said. I want to remind you, first of all, that, that anger starts with offense. 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 Okay. What you take as offense. And when you take offense, the first thing you do is create a defense. Okay? So what you're doing, your anger is a defense at an offense that you have taken. It's an overdose, an OD. Your anger, okay. Everyone who's angry with his brother. And we're talking about brother here right now. All right. So everyone that's angry with his brother, think of these two verses. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James 1.20. Right? Your anger will never bring about God's righteousness. The anger of man. And yet, the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians, and said, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Get over it quick. All right? Deal with it. But remember what I said now, because this is important. Anger is a defense against what you have perceived as offense. And yet, the scripture says in Psalm 195, verse 16, verse, wait a minute, yeah, 119, verse, 119. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, that those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. So, one of the things that happens is if you're taking offense, if you if somebody is troubling you and you're taking offense at what they have done. But it's not just somebody. It's your brother. Yes. Well, particularly. Right. Psalm 119, that's anybody, all right? But it's, we're talking here specifically about a brother, right? You've got to understand that you've got a problem mm -hmm. if you're taking offense. Right. It means you don't love God's word enough, right? And the fact is, as I started to say, we start to make excuses. For our anger and justify our own anger but excuses are the fiery arrow shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance it'll keep you from changing your mind as long as you make excuses for what you're doing that you know is not scriptural as long as you keep making excuses you'll never repent you'll never change you'll never decide to change your mind That's right. so what you what we need to do is be because this is training in righteousness that's what paul wrote to timothy all scripture is God breathed and profitable for training in righteousness. And if you don't repent, then that anger and that sin will fester and become but, turned but, into bitterness. But it, what it does is it turns you into a murderer. It'll turn to bitterness, and that bitterness, I'll tell you, will tear you up. Absolutely. It'll cripple you, it'll cripple you, it'll cripple you spiritually. And I, you know what? I've seen that kind of anger, that bitterness, cripple people physically, Absolutely. literally Absolutely. physically. Right? So let's agree on something. And if you don't agree on this, write to me. Tell me. I'm, not, I'm willing to discuss this with you. Office at BibleTalk.com. You are not entitled or allowed to your own anger. It is that simple. Your own anger is that self-defense response and mechanism. We don't have the luxury. You don't have the right to anger for what's being done to you. You why? Because first of all, God has a plan. Now, does that mean, okay, I, and I hate to hear all these questions. Well, you know, God, yeah, God expects God. me to lay a, a floor mat. Yeah. No, God expects you to trust in him. God expects you to be able to, to have his word, which he wrote on the tablets of your heart, come out out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, that this should be the abundance of your heart, that you could say like David, deliver me from my enemies, oh my God. Set me securely on high away from those who rise up against me. <clears throat> Listen to this. This is Psalm 3, right? Listen to these words. 
O Lord, this is the cry of David, O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying in my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my hand. I was crying. The, the Lord is the defense of your life. Cry out, defend me, O Lord. It's not a matter of being a floor mat. It is a matter of having the faith to trust in God. And this is so important. All right? I'm going to just go through these other things because we'll kind of come around in a circle. Whoever says to his brother, Raka. Now, depending on your translation, I think in my New American Standard, and you guys probably have the same thing, it says good for nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? Whoever says to his brother, good for nothing. Yes. Uh, Young's literal translation of the Bible says, translate that as empty fellow. The word that's literally used here, that word raka in the Greek, and by the way, that's the only appearance of this word in the New Testament. What it means is worthlessness. All right? So when you say to somebody that that person is worthless, how much is a person worth? Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, I was referring, I mean, years ago, many, many years ago, long, long, oh my goodness gracious, a long time ago, when Alice and I were started, this is like going back to 1980, 81, or we were traveling around the country and I was preaching, and I went and I preached to the Salvation Army over in Titusville, Florida, as we were traveling around. And at the time, there were a group of fellows there from a prison uh, work, work release, work release program. Mm -hmm. And as I was preaching, it just, you know, I just all off, kind of off the cuff. And I don't know what brought it up. But I said to these guys, one of the guys there, I said, you know, how much are you worth? And at the time, I don't know, minimum wage was maybe three, four dollars an hour. And so one of them popped up and said, you know, four dollars. And another one said, oh, no, no, I'm worth five dollars an hour. And it, this one, I kind of became... You know, they were fooling around a little bit. I'm worth ten dollars an hour. What determines what something is worth? So at the time, there was really a beautiful brother who was the pastor of that Salvation Army. It is, a, you know, it's supposed to be a church, by the way. Uh, and he was just a beautiful guy, and he had been a rock musician before he was saved and became a pastor in the Salvation Army. And he had still had his guitar, so very, very expensive, very expensive guitar. I think at the time, and again, this is 1980, so. You know, the guitar was worth like $5,000 or more. Mm -hmm. So I walked over and I picked up his guitar, tested his faith, I'll tell you right. And I said, what's this guitar worth? And that's what he said to me. It's worth, you know, his eyes were very large and he said to me, it's five, $6,000. And I said, well, suppose you wanted to sell this guitar and nobody in the world would give you more than $1,000. Then how much is it worth? Well, the answer is $1,000. I mean, when all is said and done, it's market. The market that drives the consumer price of something, the value of something. Because any anybody can put any price they want, but if nobody will buy it, bada bing, bada boom, you know. It's uh, worth nothing. So I said, but by the same token, suppose somebody walked through that door right now and looked at that guitar and said, I've been looking for that kind of guitar desperately all over the place. I'll give you $10,000 for that guitar right now. Then how much is that same guitar worth? $10,000. $10,000. So what determines its value is what somebody is willing to pay for it. Now, I just want to read this from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. You have been purchased. So somebody said, I'm willing to pay for that person. Somebody said they were willing to pay for me. Who? God the Father. Mm -hmm. What was the price? In Revelations 5, 9, listen to this verse. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you, talking of Jesus, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, mm -hmm. men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The price that was paid was Jesus Christ, his shed blood. And exactly the same price was paid for me as for the Apostle Paul or Peter or Billy Graham or, I mean, name anybody or your favorite pastor on television. If that person is saved, then the same exact price was paid. 
we tend to judge by outward appearance. Now, we don't tend to. God said man judges by outward appearance. And we think, well, this person is certainly more valuable in the kingdom of God. He's not more valuable. His soul is not more valuable to Jesus, to God the Father, than yours or yours so or no yours. One, there's no one in the world that is worthless. No, and that's the point. Because Christ died on that Christ for all mankind. That's right. So to say that somebody is worthless is to say that Christ died in vain upon that cross. Be careful what you say. You are responsible for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. And be, be careful. And to be labeled a fool is well, only that, a that's fool the other thing. Yes. Says in his heart. Well, there is no God. Thank you for getting ahead of me. You're, 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 no, that's good. You're, 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 we're on the same mindset because that's whoever says you, you're you're a fool. Now we're not talking about somebody with a low, low IQ no, here. We're talking about if you appraise it spiritually. I mean, the word fool. Look, go just go read through the Psalms. Alice quoted from David. Only the fool says in his heart, "There is no God." That's Psalm 14, 1. And again, David says it in Psalm 53, uh, 53 verse 1. Mm -hmm. And throughout Solomon's writings on wisdom in Proverbs, the term fool is equated with evil behavior and the rejection of God's grace over and over and over. So calling a brother a fool, this is about the judgment of saying a person has rejected God, is corrupt, and has committed abominable deeds. And... You know, we will see in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus saying not to judge. Well, calling somebody a fool in this sense, you're saying that that person has rejected God. And you're saying that, that they're, I mean, all of this together is worthless. Why would you say that anyhow? Tell me you're going to say this if it's not motivated by anger. If it wasn't conceived in the heart as anger. Why would you say that? Why, tell me why you would call somebody a fool, an idiot. Call somebody a fool, call, say rocket, if it had not because you took offense at something that they said. These verses all deal with the issue, first of all, of bringing our judgment rather than God's grace to bear in a situation. Think about that. If you say, if you get angry, if you call a brother raka or fool, tell me that was not conceived in your heart because you took offense at something they said. Why else would you say it? There would be no other reason. There'd be no other reason. So you're bringing judgment against this person rather than God's grace. It starts with anger. Anger that is focused on our relationship with a person. So you can, under, now thinking about that in that light, you can understand where anger, you could understand why it would be called, it would be like murder. Okay, cool. well, it is. Yeah. It's not light. light. It is Jesus murder. is saying it that it is. is. And this is what we... This is what we've got to get to where we get to the place where we literally accept what Jesus is saying here as this is reality. Mm -hmm. You know, we have spent too many centuries thinking this is nice teaching and putting it aside as reality. This is reality. All right. But this is because when these things take place, it's because we're focused on our relationship with a person rather than that person's relationship with God. Right. Okay? That's important you get that. Because I want to read this to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled himself to us through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Your purpose in being on this planet is to bring the word of reconciliation to people. It's not about your relationship with them. It is about their relationship with God. That's your purpose in life. That's why Paul goes on in that same place in 2 Corinthians. is He's telling us that our job is to, our mindset is to heal the relationship between man and God, not between man and us. So in verse 
5, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You are so focused when you get angry and when you do these things on, on what people are thinking about you. Who cares what they think about you? Paul wrote to Timothy and said, study to show yourself approved unto God. It only matters what God thinks of you. But when you start focusing on your relationship, your relationship with them, instead of their relationship with God and your relationship with God, you go off. This is ever so important. Get off that now. Be yes, because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about bringing the presence of Christ into the world, being the salt of the earth, being the light of the world. It's about bringing this word of reconciliation. And these are things that will at least murder that ministry. When you get angry with somebody, you know, with your anger, you're not going to bring God's love into this situation. You're going to bring your judgment into the situation. Okay, so now here's the paradox. Okay, I just got through saying that it's not about our relationship with them. It's about their relationship with God and our relationship with God. Right? Yes. Here's the paradox. It's very much about our relationship with them. All right? And here's why. Let's look at Matthew 23, 5. 23 and 24. Let's go on and read here in, Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 25. No, 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 no. I'm oh, continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, oh, okay. verses 23 and 24. Sorry. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So now, you just sat here and agreed with me that our ministry, and I can show you this in Scripture, is not about you know our relationship with the people. It's about our relationship with God and their relationship with, the, with God, right? Okay, so now let me read you this from Matthew 25. I'm going to start at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me, and naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he goes on, just so you know this. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger? or naked, or sick in prison, and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Your relationship with people is indicative of your relationship with God. Okay? It's based on your relationship with the Lord because it's powered by the love of God that's been poured into your heart through his Holy Spirit. It goes back to the heart. If you have that heart that has been filled with God's love and that's what is directing, that's what's pumping through the veins of your life. Mm -hmm. That's what's reaching your head 
the heart is pumping it out, pushing it to the brains, to the feet, to the, every part of your body, spiritually, then you are going to respond to every situation with God's love. And if that's not the case, that's a warning sign that there's something wrong. And what should be coming forth from you is the Word of God, which is one of the reasons it's so important that you be filled with the Word of God. He has written His Word on the tablets of your heart, but you've got to oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You've got, to, you've got to feast on the Word of God and fill yourself with the Word of God. Study the Word of God so that out of the abundance of the heart, what will come out is the Word of God. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If the things that fill your heart are the things of the world, you know what you're going to be talking about? The things of the world. You, listen, it's that simple. If, if you believe the Bible, if you believe this is true, think about it. Take a minute. Listen to what you're saying. What are you talking about? Because what you're talking about is what fills your heart. It's like when you're speaking to somebody and your first, re, your first um, well, I want to say advice, but it's... You know, First exclamation to them about the situation is if it's a worldly uh, example, then that example. I mean that that's telling you that your heart is. Well, it's telling you you better start praying. Create me a clean heart. Yeah. You better start praying start again. Praying. Unite my heart to fear thy name. You better start getting back into that place where you understand that that the your relationship with people is going to wind up. Being your relationship with God. It's, it's, you know, this is, I said, it's a paradox because it takes your right relationship with God the Father to give you that right relationship with people. And that right relationship with people is part of your right relationship with God. And I, let me just say, I used to have people, I mean, I've done a lot of counseling over the, you know, years of, of ministry. And I've had so many, I've had, I won't say so many, I've had a lot of people come to me. I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a man, for example. And he'll tell me, he profess his love for the Lord. But he's there looking for marriage counseling because now he's telling me he doesn't love his wife. And I said, you liar. You're a liar. You're lying. But first of all, you are lying to yourself. If you tell me, and this is why I don't understand, and you better understand if we're Bible believing, and I don't get this at all. You know, I see a church that looks at homosexuality and all these other sins and, and sits there in judgment and condemnation. And, and you know, we, we need to speak out against evil. Yes. So why have we become so tolerant of divorce? I just got to tell you, it says God hates divorce. Yes. Now, I don't mean to sit here, and, and I am not sitting here in judgment, if, you know, for somebody who's been through a divorce or anything. But the fact of the matter is, it's not about what's happened in the past, but you better think about where you are and what yeah. you're doing right now. Because God hates divorce. And one of the reasons that he hates divorce is the fact that if two believers cannot love one another, choose to love. See, divorce happens because you don't have the emotion. You don't have the feeling. You don't have the outward appearance. Not you know, you, it's not based on that love of God that's in your heart. So that marriage falls apart. But you can't say that, okay, I can't live with this person. I don't want to be around this person. I don't like this person. I hate this person or whatever. What does Jesus mean when he says, whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done to me? Why is he saying here and now, before you bring me an offering, before you come to the altar, you had better be right. If you know, And you know what's interesting about this? It's not, it doesn't say, if you got somebody against something out there, it says, if you know that somebody out there has something against you, And you can say, well, hey, that's their problem. Oh, no, wait, wait a minute. If it was their problem, then Jesus wouldn't be teaching this exactly. and training us in righteousness to deal with this situation. I, this is not being taught in a lot of places or a lot of churches. I said this is radical, this is fanatical, but it is the teaching of Jesus Christ. If you know that somebody has something against you, it doesn't say that they're right or wrong, but if they have something against you, if a brother has something against you, it's now your responsibility to deal with it. Go be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't know that person? You know what? Paul talks about going to law with a brother. 
No, it, but you know, there's something that he says, and I'll paraphrase it, that really is worthy of consideration and meditation. Mm -hmm. He said, it's better for you to be wrong. Have to go for the world. Yes. If you know that somebody has something against you, whether they're right or wrong, go try to be reconciled. Do everything in your power. Is this a commentary on the Beatitudes? Blessed are the peacemakers. Be at peace with all men as much as is possible. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Be at peace with all men as much as it's in your power. Uh, you know what? You, you you don't necessarily have the power to fix every situation, but you have the you have the power within you to attempt to do this. Yeah, you can open to up the bring door for you. the word of reconciliation. And so what if it hurts you? Mm -hmm. So what? I said before, I hate to hear these Christians say, well, God doesn't want me to be a footstool. You know, God doesn't want me. Let me just tell you something. The love of Jesus Christ, and this is the love that we are to imitate, can be described in one word, vulnerable. Jesus Christ made himself vulnerable. He went to the cross to pay that price for which he paid for you. It's not about proving yourself right. And that's what brings us up is pride. You don't want people, you don't want to humble yourself in front of people. Oh, I'll humble myself in front of God, but I'm not. You know what? I don't you want gotta, to look weak in front of people. You don't want to look weak in front of You don't want to look foolish in front of people. You don't want to look wrong in front of right. people. You want to look strong. You want to look right. Exactly. You, you, that's, listen, that sounds nice. But it's pride. It's pride. Defend me, O oh Lord. Stop defending yourself. This is a lesson I learned a long time ago. I mean, you know, many, many years ago, and I'm going back into the 70s, there was because it was radical what I was preaching and teaching back then. And, you know, people responded to that. A lot of people, there were people, and many of you may not remember Jim Jones in Guyana. 900 people committing a mass suicide. That was a horrible, horrible thing. And it was evident in him from the, from the beginning, by the way. But people were saying to me, well, I'm, I'm a Jim Jones. You know, I'm building a cult. Why? Because what I was teaching was different than what was being taught in most of the mainline denominations. That's right. And my, you know, my initial reaction was, okay, I got to stand up and explain why I'm right. That's, that's natural. It is exactly natural. And, and the Lord showed me, and I made a decision. Defend me, O oh Lord. I will not defend myself. And God did defend me over and over and over. I don't need to prove that I am right because it's not about whether I'm right or wrong. It is about whether I'm preaching the word and whether the word is right or wrong. So we need to get to this place. We need to absolutely get to this place where we begin to take this teaching from the Sermon on the Mount as radical as it is, and start to say, this is what I'm going to be, this is the guide to my life. Because the next time you get angry at somebody, oh, you don't, I'm talking about when you go out now, what happens when you go out, and you know, somebody, so, well, I'm like, I don't need to give you examples. We know, we know in our own hearts. But you do know in your own heart. So, start, start living what you're supposed to be living. Let it go with that. Okay. Hallelujah. And then in verse 25 here in Matthew 5, it says, Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. It doesn't, you know, it says, Oh, nothing to any man but love. Do what's right. I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm trying to think, you know, one of the things that I see in our world today, I don't know any other way to put this, is a lack of character. Truly, truly a lack of character. Well, People, there's been no persecution. Well, well, I'm going to, yeah, okay, she's ahead of me. I, I just was telling that to somebody. But it's like, okay, how does this manifest itself? A lack of character leads, is part of that is a lack of integrity. Yeah. 
And you see, I mean, it's, everywhere you go, you see a lack of integrity. People doing anything to quote unquote survive. Lie, cheat, okay. steal. Whatever, whatever. That's a lack of character, mm -hmm. a lack of honesty, a lack of, where does that character come from? You know, what Alice was just saying, that comes from Romans chapter five. That goes back to that same place where Paul wrote and said that the love of God has been poured into our heart. But what does he say? Well, let's just go take a quick look, right? Because I want you to see that, right? Romans 5. Okay. Starting in verse 3, mm -hmm. Paul says, And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance proven character. There's that character. There it is. And character, proven character leads to hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We in the Western world have lived in a culture of comfort ever since the Second World War ended. And our parents and grandparents came home from that war from a time, from years of sacrifice and, and sacrifice to the point of literally millions of lives. Sacrifice put on everybody's part. And they didn't want their kids to have to go through that same thing, so they built comfort. Well, it sounds nice. But we're reaping that now. But now we're reaping. Because you know what? That's why we're supposed to exalt in our tribulations. Because that's what? It's those hard times that build character. It's not the easy times to build character. It's the hard times to build character. Well, we have made the times easy. And the result of that is a lack of character. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, let's try and go out and make the world hard for people. But what we have to do is stop putting false things in there. It says, okay, you're not responsible. You know, it's somebody else's fault. And, and we've taken all of that out. Buffers, of all these buffers that kind of play and, around. And we've tried to take all what we call tribulation out. We live in the most comfortable society that has probably ever existed on the face of the earth over thousands and thousands of years. And we take things for granted. I mean, the three of us have all been to places where they don't take, they don't take water for granted. No. You know, certainly, I mean, places where they don't have electricity, where they don't have things that we take for granted so much. And we think that's tribulation. Well, sure, it's hard. But isn't it interesting that in so many of those places, spiritual things are stronger, that people's character is stronger. Don't try and make things too easy. Try and make things too right. I mean, try and make them right. Yes, it can be painful, um, you know, when somebody does you wrong and you turn around and love them in return. But that is the Sermon on the Mount. And that, would you say that would be an affliction if somebody is wrong? Well, affliction? Yeah, everything, I mean, comes because against I was, that, you know, that, I was thinking you know. in Corinthians where God says he will comfort us right. in our afflictions. He does comfort us in our afflictions, yeah. yes. So it, yeah. But yes, I mean, obviously there are degrees. Again, in the West, and I, you know, I've written about this on Bible Talk frequently on our news on the front page, the fact that the persecution of Christians around the world is, is just increasing massively. But particularly here in the United States of America, we don't feel it. So we don't think it's real. And because it's not happening to us, we kind of just, oh, it happens. You know, uh, and, and I don't mean to sound crass or to toss this off too lightly, but I, you know, 3,000 people were killed in an attack on, on New York City on the World Trade Center back in uh, 2001 and that's a horrible thing yes, yes. and we commemorate that constantly I mean they're they're working on building that new building I think that's reached the top floor or something there and uh, where the World Trade Center was but the fact is you know it wasn't terribly long after that that a quarter of a million people were killed by a tsunami in the Far East a quarter of a million not 3,000 not 30,000 250,000 250, people died in one incident. And they, they would say more than 80 times. But they say that's an act of God. 
uh, I say it's all an active guy. He's in control. Yes, the other is. thing is, okay, so 3,000 people, I don't have the exact statistics. And I, I, listen, I do not mean to make light of the fact that 3,000 people died on that day by any means. But how many children will die in third world countries today because they don't have clean yeah. water or, or food. enough food? Thousands. Thousands. Mm -hmm. Where's our concern? Whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, where's our concern? The point that I'm making is if it, doesn't, if it doesn't directly affect us in some way, we have no concern, by and large. And that's a lack of character. It is a lack of character. So, okay. Let me go on. Back to Matthew chapter 5. I, the, the thing that I want to say, I'm, I'm just feeling a passion to say this over and over tonight. Okay. Is, it, is the fact that everybody that I know who has been a Christian for any length of time has verses that they know out of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Every word here is God-breathed. Yes. Every word here is specifically the teaching of Jesus Christ, the training of Jesus Christ for his apostles, his disciples. Tra First of all, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and what he is saying is that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable. For what? For correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. That's what Jesus is doing. He's correcting us. And believe me, this is correction. Yes, it is. It's a reproof. When he has to sit there and tell these people, and he's telling us, you get angry, you're committing murder. But that's training in righteousness. Because we're supposed to be now understand that he's given us new life by his act on that purchase on the cross. And we need to live a new lifestyle. And that new lifestyle is to bring the love of God into the world to touch the lives of people. Not anger. And over and over we'll see here in the Sermon on the Mount that it's our response to evil is supposed to be love. Our response, blessed are those who are persecuting. And the world will tell you that anger is good. Well, the, the, the psychiatrist and all, you know, they, you have to vent yourself. If you don't get angry, you're going to keep Well, as angry. much as you're trying, you're not going to get me angry then. That's, that's some, that being angry over and over again to release it is like exercising a muscle. Over time, that anger gets stronger and stronger and stronger. That's right. That's, that's man's wisdom. By the way, there is such a thing as a righteous anger. Remember I said, yes. you know, Paul wrote and said, be angry and yet do not sin. Anytime you get angry at something that's been done to you, I promise you that's not a righteous anger. Okay? Did Jesus ever get angry? Yes. Absolutely he did. He got angry at the money changers in the, in the temple. When he said this is a house of, you know, he got mad at the Pharisees who were leading his people astray. Yes. Okay? But never at anything that was done to him. And let that be the guideline for your life. You may never get angry at something that's been done to you. That will never be righteous anger. And and there's something, you know, anger is an emotion. Yes. Emotion can arise in anybody. It's a feeling, it's a, right? It's a deed of the flesh. Yes, it is a deed of the flesh. That's what Paul says Galatians. in his Galatians chapter 5. Contrasting that, contrasting it to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, mm -hmm. all right? And that's the contrast. But you're going to have emotions arise. I mean, that you have... That's not something you have control of. What you do have is that you have the ability to have self-control. Once that arises, that's another fruit of the Holy Spirit. That you can take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, and you can choose how to respond when anger arises in you. So you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. You think that you know the majority of people are not going to feel a rise of anger in them? That in itself is not sin. No. Unless you allow it to live. Yes, sir. This yes, is you know, it's, like, it's like the lust, I, and it's almost like going back to where, where we started with Ananias and Sapphira, mm -hmm. when um, Peter said to, to Ananias, "You know, Satan has it's like Satan has planted this, but you let it, you conceived it in your heart, right? It's like we're the flesh is we're out there in the world, all right, but you have to choose what to do with that now, and you have to choose to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, and you have to choose." to love rather than hate, 
all right? This is God's instruction in your life. But we better start getting this down because we are in the last days when lawlessness will increase. We are in the, we are in the last days when violence will increase. And there's going to be more and more reason in the natural for that emotion to arise. And you have got to capture it and respond with the love of God. Do not let your love grow cold in these perilous, perilous last days. And it's more important than ever that we allow to people to see that love of God at work in our lives, that we can be at peace with all men, that regardless of what they do, it's not based on the fact that they like us or are treating us nice, regardless of that, that we have the power to love them in return. This is the picture of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross as he, as he is on his last moments of life, and he prays, Father, forgive them, to a people that have been more horrible to him than anybody that has ever existed before or after. But a Roman centurion, a non-believer, saw this and said, truly this was the Son of God. Let people see, and that's what the Sermon on the Mount says, that's what Jesus said, let people see those good works in your life and give glory to God the Father. We have to start living this. It's not enough to sit around and have nice, lovely Bible studies. Or have pre-services where we go and sing songs and then have coffee and cake afterwards. Action. We need to start putting this into our lives. You know, it, it says in Proverbs, in all labor there is profit. Mere talk leads only to poverty. Yes. Bible studies are nice and we need them. But if, you, if it doesn't result in action, if it doesn't become the action of your life, we've just wasted time together. And we don't have time to waste so get it in your heart that you're going to choose the next time anger arises, and it will, yes, it will. that you put it down and you respond with love. I don't see that happening in the world around us at all. I don't see that happening in the church around us. No. Well, you know what? We're talking about the church. That's, yeah. and it's, it's, it's not. And it's a real, real problem because we have to bring the ones regardless of the cost to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a key phrase, regardless of the cost to ourselves. We have to bring the love of God into every situation. And we need to understand that the way we're treating people, and we've got to see the inside of the matter, the heart of a matter. I said that God says man judges by outward appearance, but the Lord searches the heart. How did Peter know what was in the heart of Ananias? That is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There is discernment. There is a word of knowledge. God, and you know what? And things are revealed by what people speak. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is not a matter of judgment. It's a matter of discernment. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? We need to be seeking the heart of the matter. Not, not what's going on on the outside. What's going on on the outside, that's passing. And it'll pass by and it'll pass away. But we need to get, like the Lord, down to the heart of the matter. We need to become intolerant of sin in our lives. Uh, we're great at being intolerant of sin in other people's lives. We need to become intolerant of sin in our lives. Create me a clean heart, O oh Lord. So, Father, we do thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a new heart. A heart, Lord, that has been purified. And it's our desire to keep it that way, Lord. To be trained in, in righteousness. To be led in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. That's our desire. To bring your love. To bring you the word of reconciliation into every situation where anger has arisen. Not to call people worthless, but to bring them the good news of how much worth they have that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die in their place. Not to call them foolish, but to bring them the word of the wise. And that word is, Jesus Christ died for your sins, if only you will accept it. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your son Christ Jesus, the word made flesh. God bless you until next time, and we'll see you soon.